Welcome to this overview of our project complexity assessment tool, which we consider essential to early life cycle management, an idea of being able to identify the issues necessary to deal with complex projects, and to make sure that your project team and the organisation has the necessary competence level that's appropriate for the complexity of the project itself. First of all, a couple of definitions, and let's make it clear from the start that there is a difference between complicated projects and complex projects. Complicated projects are when you know what you have to do, where there are a set of rules and things that you have to follow in order to be able to achieve a solution. Quadratic equations are a good example of these. They're, they are difficult, but there are a set of rules, and if you follow those rules, then you will be able to solve the equation. A complex project, however, is when you don't know what you have to do. Anybody who's had experience of bringing up children will know exactly what I mean. When life is full of what Donald Rumsfeld called unknown unknowns. And we need to use appropriate tools and methods to deal with the uncertainties of complex projects. We have a set of tools already, and I will call these first order tools, and let me emphasise that these are absolutely essential. I am not uh, criticising the use of them at all. Project Management Body of Knowledge, Earned Value Management, Prince 2, Life Cycle Management, CMM Integration, all of these things are absolutely essential, but sometimes they're just not enough. If you imagine you were learning to play a musical instrument, then the way that you would start is with the basics, the fundamental techniques, scales and arpeggios. And if you don't master those, you'll never play music. But equally, Nobody's ever going to come to listen to you playing those scales and arpeggios. If you want to play a concerto, then you take those basic first order techniques and you add additional techniques to them. When it gets difficult, you need things over and above the first order tools. We'll call them second order. And each of these is described in other videos in this series at a greater length, but for the moment, uh, briefly, adhocratic leadership is leadership that is flexible, where the repertoire is broad enough to be able to deal with whatever happens, as opposed to bureaucratic leadership, which has to follow process. We talk about appropriate contracting models, appropriate to the specifics of the project, its duration, its size and its complexity and its uncertainty, of course. Outcome management is about making sure that our project delivers a product, because process, process compliance, good as it is, isn't what we're looking for. We are looking to win a war, not just a battle. And so we need to look at the overall outcome of what it is that we're going to do. And we use tools to do this, tools like systems thinking, uh, Examples being the viable systems model, soft systems methodology, our own uh, process which we term system anatomy modelling. And all of these help to deliver the requisite variety, the flexibility that's necessary. Requisite variety really is about having more answers than there are questions. And it's developed through a process of experiential learning, of understanding what's happened in the past and being able to extrapolate that into the future. To address complexity, then we have to address the two basic dimensions that form complex issues. The competences of the organisation and the team, and the specifics of the project at hand, and these will combine to give a, a, a level of complexity in the project that we are looking at. These are explained in more depth uh, in other videos in this series, but we're talking about 
leadership and team experience and behaviours, about the experience that we have in, in, in that platform and that technology, about risk aversity. That's, the, the more complex the project, the higher the risk inevitably is going to be. And therefore, if the organisation is has a risk averse culture, it's going to find a, a lot of complexity, a lot of difficulty in making rigorous enough risk planning. Turbulence of the wider environment and experience generally in the processes, the methods and the tools that we are going to use. There are project specific complexities as well. Urgency, number of interactions, how new this kind of project is to us. Stability of the overall project envelope of scope, cost and duration. Is it safety critical? Can people be injured if the project doesn't deliver the outcome re that's required? And I think particularly the communications between the various stakeholders, which is going to be a function of their geographical separation, of their level of and quality of, of their relationships, geographical separation as well. The way we assess this is by using an online questionnaire. A hundred questions, and this questionnaire is issued to every team member, or even better, every stakeholder. And they're asked to complete these questions, all of which relate to the various drivers that we talked about before, the competency drivers, the project-specific drivers. Responses are collected online via a secure process, and then analysed in a number of different ways. Sometimes we are going to find good news out of this. Uh, some, we produce a report with the, the top ten positives. In this particular example, the team is very confident that they feel fully qualified to perform their role. And these areas are not ones where we shouldn't perhaps just pursue uh, and validate these, but at least we have some confidence that there are areas that are, are going to enable us to perform what is necessary in this project. There are also going to be areas that need to be fixed immediately. In this particular case, if, if the bid didn't contain adequate contingency, then we need to do something about that, and there is a strong consensus that we need to do something about it. Most significantly, we need to look at areas where there is a lack of consensus, where people across the team, across the stakeholder population, have very, very different views of whether we are capable of doing this or not, what our experience level is. As well as looking at the individual, then we group those questions and give them a particular weighting to look at their contribution to the generalised complexity drivers in terms of competencies and in terms of project specifics. We look at examples, uh, this, this particular example says okay, although the, uh, this, this particular project isn't uh, safety critical, then it's highly intricate. There are lots of difficulties in stakeholder interactions and we need to look both at internal communications and the contracting models. We take these and then we produce a scatter plot of competence versus complexity by responder. And this scatter plot gives us an idea of the level of consensus and it also positions us on a project complexity matrix. The project complexity matrix looks a little like this and this allows us to gain an understanding of the approach that we need to take. If we're down at the bottom left where our competency is low and the complexity is low it's just not cost effective for us to do that. We should simply just buy the necessary level of competence. If we're in the bottom right, 
where our competency is low and the complexity is high, then we have three options. We can subcontract and get the expertise from elsewhere, or we can get out. The third option, which is to proceed hoping that things will go well, is the one that we should never take. And this happens all too often. And an awful lot of the projects, the complex projects that go wrong, are simply because people didn't accept that they were not competent to take them on. There's no room for heroism in managing complex projects. The courage to actually get out would save an awful lot of money and an awful lot of heartache. If we're up there in the top left, where our competency is high and the complexity is low, that's our bread and butter. And first order project management tools are quite capable of delivering a satisfactory result. But it's here where the glittering prizes are to be won, where the projects are complex but our competency is high. And if we are operating in that quadrant, then we need to deploy the first order process tools and the second order leadership tools that are necessary in order to deliver this. And it won't be risk free, but at least we have the competence to do so. And if we deploy those tools correctly, then we will find that we can deliver far more complex projects than we have done in the past. We can run the project complexity assessment at any time during the project life cycle. And it might be that it's useful to repeat it at various stages. But it certainly has to be done as early as possible in that life cycle, and certainly before final contracts are agreed. We need to know where the uncertainties are. We need to know what the unknowns are. We need to know whether we are competent to address the complexities of the project at hand. And the Project Complexity Assessment Tool allows us to do that. You're not, we might not like the answer, but at least we will know what's in store in the future.